the topic today is the uh, next president and the last president of the United States of the world. Before we talk about this today, there are some big questions that you and I need to ask and we need to answer. If you're going to be happy, who am I? Who, who am I? Am I uh, the product of, of time plus matter plus chance? Can life, as Professor Dawkins from Oxford University says, can life come from non-life? Uh, can knowledge, information come from chaos? Did you know that in the human body there are literally trillions of cells? Did you know that in each cell you have the information that is found in a library of a hundred thousand volumes, each of a thousand pages. Mm. I need to discover this recently, so I'm sharing it with you. <laughs> but did all this information, where did this information come from? Uh, the Russians, I've been to Russia many times and spoken to millions of atheists. And the Russians for almost 70 years were taught that they were machines or animals. So... Uh, what am I? Am I an animal? Am I a machine? Or am I something infinitely of more value? Richard Dawkins said, and you've all heard of the great professor Richard Dawkins, the world's most famous atheist. He said that the best thing a person can do as he approaches the end of his life is to stand on the deck of the ship and salute. Go down with the ship because he said there's nothing after that. Today we're going to explore life's biggest questions and I want to read this statement to you and I want you to get it down into the molecules of your mind because it's of great importance. If genuine prophecy exists, the main issues of our age are met. I want you to think about this, it's a philosophical question. If genuine prophecy exists, then the main issues of life and of the, our age are, are met because if there is genuine prophecy, it shows that we are not alone in the universe. It shows that there is a super mind uh, that can see into the future. If genuine prophecy exists, the main issues of life are met. The Quran is not a book of prophecy. Neither are the writings of the Hebrew scholars. There is only one book that claims to tell the future. And that is this book here, which is called uh, the Bible. And today we're going to notice an amazing prophecy. In, in fact, we're going to notice at least two prophecies, amazing prophecies that as far as I'm concerned, and I think as far as you are concerned, after we're through here today, you will say uh, genuine prophecy does exist. I want you to come in the Bible now to the book of Isaiah, chapter, chapter 13, verses 19 and onwards. The book of Isaiah. This book takes us back about 2,600 years. Remember that date. It goes back to about 600 or 700 BC. Isaiah, chapter 13, and verse 19, I want all of you folks just to notice it. We're going to put it up here on the screen and we're going to notice it in the Bible. The Bible says, this was written about six, 700 BC and Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans pride will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It will never be inhabited, nor will it be settled from generation to generation, nor will the Arabian pitch tents there nor will the shepherds make their folds there the greatest days of babylon were still to come when this verse was written but wild beasts of the desert will lie there and their houses will be full of owls 
Ostriches will dwell there, and wild goats will caper there, and hyenas will howl in their citadels, and jackals, remember the word jackal, jackals in the palaces. Her time is near to come, and her days will not be prolonged. Uh, I've been to Babylon on many occasions. It's in the old land of Mesopotamia that we call today Iraq. Babylon was once the United States of the world. It was the great superpower. It was a magnificent place. This is, as you would know, this is the famous Ishtar Gate, named after the mother goddess. And from here we get the ceremony or the tradition of Easter, the Ishtar Gate. And this great city was founded upon the great river Euphrates that we're going to talk about as we go along today because Babylon was finally overthrown because of the river Euphrates. The walls, the palaces were made of glazed brick. It was the dominant power in the world about 2,600 years ago. The most famous ruler was King Nebuchadnezzar. I want you to see something here. Do you want to see just a little bit of magic? You ready for just, it's not really, folks. Want to see a little bit of magic? What I'm going to do, I'm going to, my, was that magic or was it not? It was, I tell you, it was magic and it actually happened. <laughs> This contains the building list. I took this in the uh, British Museum. It contains the building list of Nebuchadnezzar. It talks about his arrogance when he walked around the city and he said, is not this great Babylon that I have built for my glory? And it is written down here in the strange letters that we call the cuneiform. Now, the years rolled by, and some of you folks will be aware of this from studying history. The years rolled by, he died, and after other years, one of his descendants was a young larrikin, as they'd say in Ireland, or a waster by the name of Belshazzar. Now, for many, many, many years, skeptics said that Belshazzar did not exist because in the cuneiform it said that the last king of Babylon was uh, Nabonidus. But it's an interesting thing that the Bible said that the last king of Babylon, the last king on the throne was Belshazzar. And skeptics said for many, many years, it is another evidence that the Bible is phony. But then scholars, archaeologists discovered this. Woof, there it goes. It says here, look at it. The foundation cylinder marking the restoration of the temple of the moon god at Ur by King Nabonidus. It ends with a prayer for him and his son, Belshazzar. And what actually happened was this, that Nabonidus got sick of it all. He got sick of fighting Congress and the Senate. And he retired to the hill country and his son took over the throne. Now, I want you to notice a very interesting text here. I want you to come to Isaiah 45 and verse 1, my friends. Isaiah 45 and verse 1. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings to open before him the double doors so that their gates will not be shut. I want you to think of this. The Bible says that come a man after Nebuchadnezzar, and his name was Cyrus. And he would be the person who would overthrow the city of Babylon. And it says, the gates would not be shut. I want you to remember that. This is interesting because Cyrus did not operate until 150 years 
after that text was written down by the prophet. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. This description of Cyrus by name uh, is written down in the Hebrew writings uh, more than a hundred years before he was born. And it says, when Cyrus got to the place, the gates would not be shut. Let me tell you, I've got to tell you so much today. Uh, Babylon was surrounded by tremendous uh, walls. I've been there on many occasions. Four walls. Uh, total thickness of the walls about 80, 90, 100 feet. And when the Medo-Persian army surrounded the city of Babylon, they could not break down the walls. But flowing through the heart of Babylon was this. I want you to see this. I want you to see this. I'm going to show it to you. Here it comes. The river Euphrates. Mm. Now the story is told and confirmed by one great historian that when the armies of Cyrus saw that they could not break down the walls, they diverted the river Euphrates. Now, I want you to come in your Bible over here to Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 38 and 39, the book of Jeremiah. We're not talking about Isaiah. We're coming over here to Jeremiah chapter 50 and verse 38 and 39. Have you got that? Jeremiah 50, verse 38 and 39. The Bible said, A drought is against her waters, and they will be dried up. For it is the land of carved images, and they are insane with their idols. There the wild desert beast shall dwell. The wild desert beast shall dwell there with the jackals, and the ostriches will dwell in it. It will be inhabited no more forever, nor will it be dwelt in from generation to generation. History tells me the soldiers, Cyrus the Great, diverted the river Euphrates and they actually marched down the muddy banks into the river Euphrates and they waded along the bed of the river Euphrates. And when they came to the dub double gates for the first time, time in Babylon's history the gates had not been locked now you say to me uh, you know I couldn't believe the Bible because it's all faith we are not talking faith here today you want to hear what I'm saying we are not talking faith we are talking facts we are talking evidence this is not just pie in the sky in the sweet by and by. We are talking evidence and facts now. And at the very same time that this was going on, there was Belshazzar, whose name is written down in the Nabonidus inscription. And that he was having this drunken feast. And the Bible tells me a bloodless hand came and wrote on the wall of the palace, many, many, tackle you fasten. And that was the end of the Babylonian Empire, the Neo-Babylon uh, Babylonian Empire. And then Babylon went down and down and down. I have visited there many times on one occasion. This is the line of Babylon. In Bible prophecy, Babylon is called the line. This is the line of Babylon that you can see today in the city of Babylon. Very hard to go there today. When I was there with a television crew, I went to Nebuchadnezzar's summer palace. Uh, this is a buddy, my cameraman from Texas. And we climbed up into Nebuchadnezzar's summer palace. <laughs> Don't have time to tell you the story, but we were surrounded to seem by the Iraqi army. Uh, and helicopter gunships over our heads. Uh, we were carrying what looked like a bazooka. It was a, it was a tripod, tripod case. And the colonel came to me, he said, what on earth are you doing? We told him what, he said, well, you see that car over there? That's Saddam Hussein, our president. And the CIA couldn't get close to him. Hmm? Hmm? I'm, no, I'm telling you, he was over there. 
They said, what are you doing here? We said, we are here because we believe the Bible. And another amazing thing happened when I was there. In Nebuchadnezzar's sum of Pallas, we disturbed a little creature, a jackal, came running out of the ruins. Mm. I stood there and I said to myself, there's a God in heaven and the Bible is true. And I believe in the Bible, not because I was brought up to believe the Bible. I want you to hear this. I believe the Bible, not because of blind faith. I believe the Bible because of overwhelming evidence. You hear what I'm saying today? Yeah. Now here you've got it. There you've got Nebuchadnezzar's palace. This is where we met the soldiers of, of uh, Saddam. Uh, along here, Saddam came with his, his soldiers. And it is in the same, in, in same place that I disturbed a little jackal. I want to tell you something today. I have seen divine predictions fulfilled. I believe in the Bible, not because I was brought up to believe in it. I do not believe because of blind faith. I believe in it because of the overwhelming evidence. Amen. You get it? Yes. Well, now. We're going to talk about the king's amazing dream. The vision of uh, the Superman. Okay. Now I want you to come to the book of Daniel. Uh, this book was written, we believe, around 600 BC. It's a very ancient book. A portion of it was discovered in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And therefore, we believe it goes back many, many years before Christ. Daniel chapter 2, verses 1 down to 3. Have you got it? Now, in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, you say, sure, there's a Nebuchadnezzar? Absolutely. I've seen his name in the cuneiform. Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled. So troubled that his sleep left him. Then the king gave the command to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans, to tell the king his dreams, so they came, and they stood before the king. And the king said to them, I've had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. It is self-explanatory. The king has a dream. It's like a nightmare. It scares the daylights out of him, and he asks for the magicians, the spiritualists, and the philosophers, the smart guys, to come and tell him all about it. Now look at Daniel 2, verses 4 to 11. Then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever, tell your servants the dream, and we will give the interpretation. But the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, My decision is firm. If you do not make known to me to the dream and its interpretation, you shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made an ash heap. However, if you tell the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts, rewards, and great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation." They answered again and said, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will give its interpretation. The king answered and said, I know for certainty that you would gain time because you see that my decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me, there is only one decree for you. For you have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the time has changed. Therefore, tell me the dream and I shall know that you can tell me the interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked any such thing of any magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. It is a difficult thing that the king requires. And there is none other who can tell it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Now let me tell you the story. These men are shown to be what they are, that they are phonies. And so the king, not being a model of Christian charity, says, we're going to put them all to death. Now, listen to this. In the wise man's union, all these phonies, they had placed a young man from Jerusalem who'd been brought to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar when he overthrew Jerusalem in 605 BC. His name was Daniel. And he's the star of this presentation. 
They come to kill Daniel. The soldiers do. Daniel says, why is the decree so hasty from the king? Give me time. So the king says, okay, give you time. Daniel goes, the Bible says, and he prays. And Almighty God tells him what the king dreamed. Not only does the Almighty God tell him what the king dreamed, who can know another man's dreams? But he tells the king, tells Daniel exactly what it means. Now listen, as you've never listened before. I want to tell you folks something. You say to me, you got a lot of confidence? Yeah, I sure have. Because I have seen things. Mm-hmm. I have seen uh, the leaders of atheism in Russia and Ukraine uh, say we have no answer. Would you be the judge, please? And would you notice chapter 2, verse 24 to 28 in this book that is 2,600 years old, uh, Daniel 2, verse 24 Onwards. Then Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me before the king, and I will tell the king the interpretation. Then Arioch quickly brought Daniel before the king and said to him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah who will make known to the king the interpretation. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the secret which the king has demanded, uh, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed uh, were these. Now listen carefully. Look at me. I believe the Bible not because of blind faith, I was not brought up in a cloister or in a church. I've met people who say, why do you believe the Bible? They say, well, I just believe. That is a nonsense statement. Unworthy of anybody with any brain at all. No wonder the skeptics and the atheists laugh. But I believe, my friend, because... Not a blind faith, but because of the evidence. Now, today, I've proven to you that there is such a place as Babylon. Once upon a time, skeptics derided that there was even a Babylon. We know that there is and was a Babylon. We know today it is in the very state that the prophet said it would be in. It is a howling wilderness and a desolation. I know that. I have seen that. I have seen divine predictions fulfilled. We know that there was a Nebuchadnezzar. We know that. This is not faith. Don't talk to me and say, it is all airy-fairy. No, no, no. It is the truth. His name is written down in the inscriptions. We know that there was a Belshazzar. We know this. We know that he was the son of Nabonidus. We know this. And we know that there was Osiris. In the British Museum, I had the privilege of going and inspecting. We had it on the screen before. We're not going to put it up now. It went past so fast because I forgot. But in the British Museum, there is this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful cylinder. It talks about Cyrus 
and how Cyrus defeated his enemies and the Babylonians and how he let the people go free. It's all written down. You see, it is written in the Bible and it is written in the inscriptions. And mine eyes have seen the glory. Mm -hmm. Now, what we're going to do is this. This is the Cyrus cylinder. There it is, the Cyrus cylinder that actually talks about his mighty exploits as in the Bible. Now, next time, the story of the Superman uh, and the history of the world and the next president of the United States of the world. I've just come from Russia via Switzerland and I'm now in Kiev, the capital of Ukraine. This place has got huge memories for me because back in 95, we ran a campaign in this city and in spite of terrific opposition, by the grace of God, we baptized 3,530 precious souls in the Nipa River. I'm back here today because I believe that we need to take care of the people we baptize. I don't believe it's right to baptize people and then to walk away and to leave them literally in the cold. When I read my Bible, I find where the Apostle Paul went back time after time to visit the people that he had baptized. And so I'm back here today for the 43rd time in Russia and Ukraine together to visit the people. I'm back here to preach the gospel of Christ. I'm back here to explain the word of God and let these people know that they are not forgotten and never will be forgotten. We believe that there is a tremendous opportunity for the preaching of the gospel of Christ in this part of the world. The soul hunger still exists and uh, the Carter Report has got a goal to take the gospel of Christ to the people of Russia and the people of Ukraine. I just want to say to you, dear friend, my heart is overwhelmed with thankfulness for your magnificent support. Thank you in Jesus' name. For a copy of today's program, please contact us at P.O. Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358. Or in Australia, contact us at P.O. Box 861, Terrigal, New South Wales, 2260. This program is made possible through the generous support of viewers like you. We thank you for your continued support. May God richly bless you.